So by 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 pushing the boundaries of this form of this of this traditional quote unquote art form that had fallen out of favor with um, with people um, of your generation when you were an art student, um, by by doing all of this, you, there was actually you contributed to a renewed interest um, in in that art form, which is 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 isn't is is a, is a I think. I think it's hard to understand from the United States to how these traditional art for how they function within um, some of our communities. I say it too as a as a as a Colombian um, immigrant, um, and how there are certain things that become prized um, outside, um, but not necessarily valued. Um, within and then there's with a revival like this that you're describing um it it, it you, you've moved it into a you've helped move it into a new direction which i think is 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 an is a beautiful thing to see yeah and you know of course it's complicated and there's many broad aspects to it because in also when i became interested in understanding for myself because i did not have much knowledge of of miniature painting, you know, um, and as it is, it's like, how can you have so much detailed knowledge of a genre that is over several centuries across mm -hmm. different geographical histories, and you cannot try to narrow its understanding through one or two books that might be available in the library at that time. So it's an ongoing understanding of what it entails and what is possible there. And um, so that, so it was never a very, for me, it wasn't just the, I, it wasn't a nationalistic art form. Right. I mean, it is an, an art form that has crossed. Um, yeah. It was always very always, yeah. rural in many ways. Right. And I think what has happened with the, with the, with the interest in the work that I was creating in the early 90s. And then as the Department of Miniature Painting in Pakistan started to emerge and grow, and it the, the narrative shifted towards a much more kind of exporting a very Pakistani nationalistic art form under the banner of miniature painting, contemporary miniature painting, and it got in the term new miniature got added to it and at that time i i was being removed from it because i was not i was outside of pakistan right so these are very interesting things that tend to happen and i think these ideas have been prevalent in my work because so much of it deals with the expunged narratives and like this particular work in very interestingly I play on that through the painting and the animation itself. It's like I removed all the female figures. So I first painted them in. <laughs> so I painted the uh, feminine female figures from Indian uh, religious paintings or the Indian myth mythic works into the court painting and the Mughal court painting. So it's already misplaced. So I, and then when I remove them, they leave behind their hair. And in there, and then that hair, as it generates movement and you can choreograph it, it becomes like bats or uh, movements of, of migrant movements, or they are dislocated from their origin, but they are not changed. I kept the iconography very much intact. So the shape is very much the, the head and the bun. I see and, it. Yeah. And then when uh, when you see it without, you can't tell. It looks like birds or bats. or So it is able to um, create its own kind of story. It's not needing to be linked to its body, but it's very present at the same time. So these are, these are ideas that I was developing in terms of validity and legibility of certain images through movement. And so this is one of the, the animations at that time. I started to develop more um, video, um, video works, animated works that engage scores. And I have worked with Diyan, um, mm -hmm. who has 
uh, who's a Pulitzer winning composer for the last 10, 12 years now. And she performs live also. Some of these works are, are, are um, a little bit on um, the East India Company. I have worked on a film, Bending the Barrels. So you can see like a lot of the work is anchored in drawing. And that the idea of drawing is what allows me to um, conceive I, images, to create narratives, to reflect on broader issues that are surrounding me, whether they are social, political, whether they are cultural, but they are pertinent uh, issues of the moment that are that that have transnational urgency. So when I think of, of drawing in that way, I can think of drawing as something that can permeate and cross over these boundaries of race, religion, culture, nation, uh, nations, and, and it's forward looking in that way. And also the velocity, the magnitude, the movement that I can inject through drawing and can take it into um, moving works into animation allows then the drawing to kind of collaborate in many ways, like the libretto, with uh, with with uh, with other languages. Yeah, and, and you can see the Hindu Muslim, um, the incorporation of both Hindu and Muslim uh, narratives, and in, in so many of these, um, it, it it was thinking of the 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 gopis with the hair and in the it's. I think it's it's something that you do constantly in your in your work, um, but um, and not only with those two traditions, um, but it's meaningful right now for for very specific reasons. I think. Yeah, and you know you can see how I work with ink and gouache. Yeah, which brings me to collaboration. So yeah, so that's the composer Dion and Ali Seti who also collaborated on uh, disruption as rapture. Another uh, work which we thought we would talk a little bit about. It's uh, commissioned by um, the Philadelphia Art Museum. And I've been working with musicians and poets. And with I, we did a piece in, for the Istanbul Biennial. We did one for the Sharjah Art Biennial. So Parallax, Pivot. Uh, the last post was for the Rockman, in, uh, Rockman Museum in Shanghai. So many, many of these have happened outside of the U.S., but with, with, with histories and context and themes that engage uh, across the globe. And often, you know, I, I, Dion and I work closely, so we will travel together, do the research together, engage with the poets, and very involved process of how the autonomy of our languages come together. So this is a rehearsal with the children's choir in Lahore. And this was for the inaugural Lahore Art Biennial. And the idea was that I would uh, uh, share disruption as rapture at a very large scale um, on, on LED screens and then perform the score live. And the, the score could be could all have the ability and capacity to involve uh, the local kids in the school. So both Ali um, and uh, Ali Seti and Dian worked with uh, with the children's choir. And this is a work that engages Sufism, right? Um, so Islamic mystical traditions. Yeah, absolutely. I think very much that is the ethos of the work itself, where. Where you know you are, where you're also engaged with um, how stories are recast over time, and uh, the manuscript that it refers to is very much um, the Gulshane Ish manuscript in Philadelphia Museum's collection. It tends to be the Rose Garden of Love, I think, roughly. Yes, so it does. It's called the Rose Garden of Love, and um, it was you know, it is kind of from central India. So at that time, if you look at its, uh, the with the time when it's made, it's, I wanted to engage that particular period, which was very uh, plural. Mm -hmm. It was the religious cultural plurality at play. And that's an important lens in time. The story is a classic tale of star 
star-crossed lovers who must face daunting challenges, separation, and before they have lived so happily ever after. So the story is obviously a very cliched story, but it's a template for something bigger. And it's really the Sufi tale, and it's also this Masnavi format, right? So it reinterprets Nusrati's poem in a Masnavi format, and the reference to Sufi enlightenment and both Hindu devotional bhakti is explored through forms that I explore through forms like you can see here that are connected with uh, both the female hair as well as the wings, which were choreographed as particle systems. And for me, they start to function as connecting tissues while carrying the theme of strife and struggle for truth. Then I had the opportunity to show the piece at the Aga Khan Museum, and they too have a folio about um, that is a different from a different manuscript, but it is an illustration of the Rose Garden of Love. So this is, you can see the original uh, manuscript in its, in, in its actual form in, in site-specific location at the Philadelphia Art Museum, where my work it's is- It's a 18th century manuscript, I think, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, it's in Philadelphia. I don't know the one, Aga Khan. Yeah, this one is 18th century, and um, and the you know the poem has is written in uh, Dakani Urdu, so it's also like whatever three, four, five thousand verses, hard to translate. So how do you create a synopsis for the for the story? Right. For me, the story was really had to really be a much more experiential idea, mm -hmm. and also broadly the Hindu Sufi metaphor and message. And then it, it's a collaborative work with my long-term um, collaborative partner, uh, Patrick O'Rourke, and he and I've been working on animation since early 2000, Diyan and Ali Sethi. And I will mention one um, thing, because Ali's a classical training in, in classical ragas and music, it lends sort of a type of precision and spontaneity to the piece that comes about because again because of uh, a knowledge of classical music and so he, he said that his response in ragas to the audio visual uh, piece that I had created was more of a melodic instinct that he had developed after years of training with a master in Pakistan. And so at this point, in one of the points, you know, there is this um, Jogia mood that he is using, which is about questioning and which is the mystical. And this alap or the improvised melodic passage that he engages with is in the Raga Jogia. And that's the time when uh, the movement of the hair is heightened in ominous and is very intoxicating. The one on the left. Yeah. So when you look at those floral flower colorful bursts, those are all wings that I took from the angels that are often the just the angels in the mirage paintings. So there, there's a reference to this idea of struggle and truth and strife and and but it's born. These iconographies are literally born from hundreds of those. Um, the kind of notion of flight and wings. But it's also about what reads uh, as a motif is going to read in terms of its kinetic possibility. And that's very important for me. So the garden obviously is a, was a recurring motif in that work, and so was flight, which kind of from there I'm going to move into another uh, uh, of work, the project here is Cyprus, despite its, despite its freedom is held captive to the garden. So I visited this Korfakan cinema, which is located in the town of Korfakan, sort of um, near Sharjah, UAE, in August of 2012 on one of my research trips. And when I returned specifically to photograph the abandoned cinema, I ran into the caretaker the sole guard who happened to be from Pakistan and who had come to Sharjah as a laborer to help build the cinema in 1976. And you know, his work visa was still linked to the architecture. So this kind of gave birth to my wanting to do this particular project, which is 
he's the only uh, audience. So it's kind of like a, a last show for the caretaker, but the cinema is his life. That's how I read it. His love, his, his existence so intricately intertwined with the space as a migrant worker that this abandoned theater and its imminent death of this building in my eyes became a metaphor for his life's labor. And this is, I, I asked um, Shazia to share this specifically with us and I'm, I'm very grateful that, that you're doing this um, because I'm, I was so moved um, by this piece. Um, and also notice that we just came from speaking about Rose Gardens in a Sufi context and this, the title um, that you just read also um, is um, a famous, uh, um, from a famous poem by Ghalib, right? Um, so it, it's, it, this is, I suppose, a, a different kind of garden too and a different kind of engagement with the tradition um, as well. And just watching him be the, be the last the the last audience for for this show or the last the 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 one the single um uh person present for the last show is yeah just very very moving yeah so it says sarubabas ke azadi ke riftare chaman which is uh which translates the cypress despite its freedom remains captive to the garden and it's from the ghazal of the Urdu poet Ghalib and in the spirit of his poetry, which is very multidimensional, you know, the, the use of this phrase for me was also to elicit multiple reads. Right. So it's, uh, it, it, yeah, it obviously questions this idea of, of, of uh, citizenship, ownership, who gets to uh, the transient nature of life, who, who gets to claim um, space and geography and history. It's it's on uh, migrant labor too. It's um, it's it's many of those things, and the iconographies are are these that sort of these uh, fists are all about fear and power and colonial imperial histories too. And this doing this pro like this research and this work and this interaction with him for about a week led to the re this this gave me the idea to create my. Um, work parallax at that time. So, um, and also, you know, I was doing research, I, I simultaneously, this is a, this is all part of my research at every time I was visiting UAE and Sharjah, like I came across the British petroleum magazines where uh, oil rigs are, you know, they, the crisp oil, this photograph on the right explains it best. It's, it's an oil rig, but it's called a Christmas tree. And it was, and I made the Christmas trees after I seen these, came yeah. across the title. And I was like, oh God, this is such a kind of a British wit or humor and this sort of idea of violence and gift bearing sentiment all inherent in a symbol. And that has also led to my new series of paintings, which explore symbols of extraction and how uh, art can be a counter, this idea of abundance that art and literature brings. And so this sort of paradox of abundance and extraction and how it can play, you know, how it can assault, how it's an assault. This idea of extraction is an assault on the living planet too. Right, right. So yeah, so that, so some, some kind of, we were talking about, um, uh, histories of, of, of writing and language and, you know, how societies for me are not, like, I think societies are not static, histories are never one dimensional. So when you think of language also, say the overlapping linguistic tra tra trajectories of local and foreign languages, especially in colonial histories. So in my case, English, Urdu, but also as growing up as many other Muslim people will, uh, will share this experience. Like if, you, if you're not an Arabic speaking individual and Arabic is not your uh, mother language then, but you still learn, you do get exposed to Arabic. And what is that experience? And that's always been exciting and kind of, I've been interested in the 
visual dimension of of the script itself, which is incredibly powerful, beautiful. It has an incredible logic behind it. Geometrically, it's so precise. So this this idea of the um, the experiential through visual and through the through the recitation and through the sound, all of that collapses and gets used in some of the drawings that I make. So often people will ask, oh, is this decorative? And I'm like, no, all of this has very specific meaning. And which brings me to a kind of a more recent work, this work X. And also in Sam Le Rustam by his son. And these are all the narrow space of translation and reflection. Again, a metaphor for me for the mythos of the colonized, the migrant, the erased, the transitory, the artist, those that are caught between worlds, artistic vocabularies, cultures, practices, and histories. And that's where all these interwoven texts, they fluctuate between English and Urdu in the visual, in the written part, but also in terms of how they fluctuate in terms of the colloquial and uh, um, the colloquial and classical Arabic, for example, in Parallax. Um, all of these are, are um, ideas about language, how language um, is a point of entry, and the language of English making. The, the language of not just the, the language itself, but the language of poetry, of words, of color, of music and the, how the autonomous languages come together in this particular work. So, um, you know, it, it was, it came about by examining contested histories of power, tensions over the control of Strait of Hormuz in the Persian Gulf, the maritime trade, movement of resources and commodities, such as bodies, oil, naval warfare, East India Company, the imperial air and land travel routes are all points of reference in this particular work. So I wanted people to engage the work and then once they were drawn in, I wanted them to read more, understand more. Because then with time, you know, as it's a 15 minute piece, but it's also large. It's like 75 feet wide, 10, 12 feet. It's very immersive. And I wanted to unravel the idea of time itself. So time is being captured, not just over that time of that person's experience immersed in the work, but also in terms of their interface with that larger history of that region and how, you know, how some of those ideas can, can linger in the work. Right. Um, so yeah, so which this particular um, work was also about the movement, movement that can be literal in the physical crossing of geographical borders and movement that can also be symbolic as in the sense of belonging as where do you belong? What are you being excluded from? And so the forms then they take on you know, all these kind of possibilities in, in unexpected terrain. And for that, I just wanted to quickly show a fun project, which was when I had access to over 20 billboards in Times Square. And, you know, this was with, in partnership with the Times Square Arts Alliance. And I had um, three, four minutes every midnight in the month of October where I could uh, showcase my work and it would just descend all these like choreographed hair movements, which at that time you couldn't tell if they were birds or bats, but they would literally descend all over the screen simultaneously for, for a few minutes at midnight. It's incredible. Um, yeah, so I think um, another oh. project, oh. if we have time, no, we do have time, and I think um, as we as we speak about all of these immersive experiences that also deal with that also have spiritual dimensions and that deal with um, the the 
the sort of the aesthetics of, of the Arabic language and uh, other um, Sufi traditions, then I think we, we should talk about Princeton. Yeah, so I will get to that. So Princeton has two different projects. The, right. This is the first. last painting. And we have, we, have, we have all the time you want. This is not about, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I just kind of wanted to move from this, my interest in these, in, in histories of economy, in histories yeah. of, of, uh, of structures that are transnational, the corporate structures that often lead to these ideas around extraction. And, you know, here uh, it, it's situated in the economics department, but uh, one particular uh, um, portrait is of Adam Smith and who argues against monopolies using the demise of the East India Company as a case study. And um, I was reading Nick Robin, who is the author of The Corporation That Changed the World, explaining that East India's East India Company story more as a tragedy where there's enormous wealth generated at the cost of great harm. So Adam Smith has these noble ideas, but so much of our uh, current or our histories of economies are very much similar to East India Company. So he has these noble ideas and loft, so which is all explored through his sort of like wings and this loftiness, but at the same time, he, his, he's clothed and strapped in the, in the East India uh, company attire. So he, so his lofty ideas has wings, but he's unable <laughs> to fly. So that's sort of, he's kind of, you know, it's a play on these. I also, it's, I, I love that it's in the economics department uh, too. We are caught up in the same old inequities of wealth, the patterns from the 17th, 18th, 19th century. Is this painted on glass? Yeah, that's painted on glass. And I also have done a mosaic. And you can see the mosaic. And you know, I, I, what led me to mosaic, interestingly, was animation, because I was thinking of the dynamism of the pixel mm -hmm. which emerged in my mind as a parallel to the unit of the mosaic. And that's when I started thinking, oh, it's also about glass and light, and I can really create something with this medium, which would be um, from from animation to a much more traditional medium, but without oh, thinking of traditional. Right. So that is, uh, that is the piece called Ecstasy is Sublime Heart as Vector, which is at the Princeton University. It's about 70 feet. It's a permanent public artwork, and it's, uh, it's very much about glass and transparency and light. And um, it was, when I was working on this piece, you know, um, it, I, I was already work exploring Mirage, which has been something for me, a very powerful idea and visual understanding of the historical paintings. There are many, many paintings that deal with it. I don't have all, all images of it, but definitely um, yeah. the one here, with, which I think is the... It, which one is this? If you do, you know this yeah, I, painting. Is it? It is the Sultan Muhammad's mirage painting. I think. Yes, this is because we just we just talked about this yesterday. Um, this is. Um, uh, I will I will come and double check. Um, and and you know like for example like this particular work has been influential in in the iconography here, but. You know, there, there's no, it's a silhouette. It's a motif that has been present in, in so much of the historical miniatures. And so for me, I want to clarify, it represents a spiritual conceptualization of faith and trust. And I'm interested in all aspects of its representation. It's the idea of movement in time also as a theme and as a motif, because in the piece, the upward movement in the mosaic is also engaging the light, which for me is symbolic of the spiritual ascendancy and itself a pursuit of knowledge and truth that I thought would be appropriate in an international academic context. 
It's for the International Department of Princeton. So um, I, I wanted to, to give a, a, a little bit of a, a background for, for our audience just for a second. And, I, and you're right, that is um, the Sultan Mohammed um, uh, piece that, that, that we had been showing. So there have been uh, a lot of recent discussions about the portrayal of the Prophet Muhammad um, in figurative um, form. And one of the things that we wanted to, to know, we don't have the answers as a visual artist and as a scholar of religious studies, we don't make definitive decisions for what um, I at least don't have no desire to tell um, people what they should and should not do. But one of the things that we can do is provide context, that I can do is provide context. So um, a lot of people think that um, there has never been a tradition of portrayal of the Prophet Muhammad. And it is true that there have been uh, discussions among scholars um, and that many of them have been concerned with the possibility of uh, artists um, in representing uh, uh, figures, uh, living beings of all kinds, of recreating God's creative power. Um, and that's that's true across the board. This is not a discussion that occurs only in Islam. Um, it occurs in other religious traditions as well. Um, but, um, and in particular with representing the prophet, right, the, the concern um, that, that, that people hear about um, is the possibility of idolatry. And so the, the, the backlash that some people hear about um, re is regarding that, that question of idolatry. Now, these are devotional paintings, which are very, very different from cartoons that, that are meant to be hurtful or derogatory. So the context is completely different. Um, but I wanted to give that background because even though um, there have been debates about it, Muslims have been, or some these these kinds of images have circulated since at least the 13th or 14th century, particularly among um, secular elites. And these kinds of manuscripts were commissioned um, uh, and are very uh, beautifully detailed. So this is not the only one, um, like Shazia said. And so she's participating in a very long tradition. For me, it was also like I am a scholar in terms of a visual scholar to look yeah. at historical paintings. And I also was, they, for me, they are gorgeous and they are beautiful. And then what I was connecting with was with the emotional intelligence of the work. Right. It's a very deeply moving experience, a catalyst of sorts, which then understanding that and engaging with that idea, you know, I'm, I'm kind of tapping into that history of the motif and how I chose to um, not depict it, but to explore it. It's like it's in white gold and yeah. it really uh, illuminates with the natural light and it gives the illusion that it is moving upward. Of ascent and mirage, which is a word that that Shazia keeps saying, is is referring to the ascent um, uh, of the prophet. Which um, there's a Muslim narrative um, about him ascending uh, to the heavens um, during a miraculous night journey, which is again about creative enlightenment as an artist, and it's also about it's a very salient theme in Central Asian and Indo Persian, Indo -Persian miniature painting. So. Um, the medium here, you can see how a um, mosaic has this phenomenal uh, sense of detail. And I, I keep thinking of it as, as the pixel. Yeah. For construction. And this is uh, me working with the Franz Mir of Munich studio. That is a glass studio where I work with them. I wanted to share with some students, a little bit of, of footage of, of the work in progress. This is another work that is a permanent uh, piece in Houston, Texas, in the Midtown Park. It's also about the idea of the feminine in nature, but it's all these Marys, the Mary Magdalene's, the Miriam's, the Marys, all of this sort of collective space <laughs> under that name. And I kind of uh, wanted to, 
that image to emerge out of water. So you can't fully see it up close. You see it more abstract, but if you're, if you're able to see it from a building next door and you look down, then the face emerges out of the water. And um, there is another uh, piece here, which is, uh, which is a new work that I did. And that's here, you can see another detail. And it, in here, you know, these two sort of interlinked characters are portrayed as a circular blue. They have risen to the top. They are buoyant and afloat, very much like uh, the ethos of all my work but they exist untethered to any specific time or space while being a critical part of the natural environment. And then I wanted to show um, some drawings. So you can see how the nature of ink gouache allows me to create all sorts of different iconographies that can lead to films, that can lead to large scale installations, that can lead to these new drawings, which are almost like nine feet in height. And um, this series that we were that I was referring to a little bit earlier is derived from those uh, ex uh, looking at the oil rigs, but they are not just about the oil rigs. They are really, for me, symbols of extraction, countered with the images of abundance. And um, here, the, um, this particular one deals with the opium flower. So I'm equating um, the opium flower. It's sort of a recurring symbol throughout this current show. But here, for me, it's also the poppy blossom. It alludes to the opium industry in Afghanistan, the long-term U.S. intervention conflict there. It's also about the opium wars in China and um, with the East India Company. So that history, it's sort of, it's a theme that has happened throughout my work. And then there are, there are several trees and this one deals with more of the crisis on on nature and the assault on the living planet with the uh, uh, displacement of, of bodies, this one. And that kind of, that leads into the new animation, which is called Reckoning. And here also I'm explore, continuing to explore forms that are uh, kinetic, that reveal cyclical themes of struggle and they could embody a moment of reckoning such as between migrant and citizen, woman and power, human and nature. And it's sort of a restaging of a classical, imaginary, historical, Indo-Persian, Turkish painting. And um, here is a new uh, monograph which will come out soon and it will be on the occasion of an exhibition of mine which uh, looks at my 1980s into early 2000 work, which travels, which opens at the Morgan uh, Library Museum in New York, then travels to uh, Rhode Island School of Designs Museum, and then Houston at the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston, sort of following the trajectory of my first 10 years of being in the US. And um, I thought I would end this, if you want, with a little clip from the new animation. I think that that's wonderful. Um, I, I'm just remarking how historically engaged and how deeply um, there, there's there's something. I hesitate to say academic because that's not the right word, but there's there's something so um, intellectually uh, exciting as well as aesthetically exciting, um, so rich that that. Um, I've just, I've learned so much. Thank you. Um, and I would love it if we could, if we could end with that clip. Is it from Reckoning? It is from Reckoning. So if we begin with categories, we end with also the challenging of those categories. Yes. Okay. It's a short clip, but let me, um, I'll play it and I hope the sound comes through because it's going to pick up from my computer. Uh, uh,